Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Susan Urali, and I work at a startup called SkyMind in San Francisco. Um, I hope SkyMind rings a bell. I hope you guys have heard of Skynet and Terminator. No Terminator fans in the audience? <laughs> okay, well, um, if it rings a bell, it should. And if you think about what Skynet is and you think about our name, it should tell you, along with the very giant heading over here, what we do. <laughs> This is Andy, and Andy will introduce himself. Yeah, so I'm Andy Petrella. So I work also in a startup, but far in Belgium, you know, I control beers, chocolate, and so on. Um, so the startup is an idea around uh, the spy notebook and making, you know, data scientists uh, productive and uh, in enterprise uh, environment. And yeah, so we're teaming up with SkyMind to to do some NLP using deep learning 4G, and this is the topic of uh, this this talk. So I will. Leave Susan introducing uh, all the, the concepts behind it, and then I will come afterwards with an example in notebook that won't be able to run because, I mean, it would take time, of course, but I will at least um, show it can be done. Go ahead. OK, great. So um, what do you guys think of when you think about machine learning other than Terminator? <laughs> what do you think we can do with machine learning? Or where do you think we are? No show of hands, no, no thoughts on the matter. Yeah, go ahead. I heard that uh, a, a machine might have beaten a Go player. Yes, that's true. It's true. <laughs> well, I put the picture on the Which is very helpful, of course. Yeah. Alpha Go, yeah. Um, I put a picture of the cat up there, because uh, I'm sure you guys heard in the news a, few, a little while back how you fed um, a neural net images from YouTube and it eventually learned what a cat looks like. <laughs> so that is about where we are in terms of machine learning, nowhere close to Terminator territory. Um, despite that, machine learning is, is present everywhere. If you watch Netflix, your recommendations on Netflix are powered by machine learning. If you um, think about the canonical example of OCR, which stands for optical character recognition, the postal office uses this. Um, so the idea is that machine learning has been around for a very long time. It's probably a new way um, to think about some very old concepts. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, what deep learning is and what neural nets are. So how many guys in the audience have heard about neural nets or deep learning before? Great. Uh, how many of you guys have um, launched neural nets into production? or? Oh, wow. That's great. Um, well, just briefly going over what a basic neural net is for the rest of the people in the audience that are not familiar with uh, what a neural net is. I, you know, I, being an engineer, I like to describe everything in terms of gates and logical functions. So I would say that uh, a perceptron is really just a fancy word for a NAND gate. So what is the big deal about a, a new kind of NAND gate, right? Especially one that's been around for so long. Um, and the answer to that is that you don't have to lay out the gates to get the function you want. You can find a way to get these gates to self-organize or learn the connections to each other to give you the output that you want given its input. So if I had to rephrase, I would probably say something like, you want a learning algorithm where you show it a ton of examples that are your input and it sees, and it sees the output and it has a way of learning or predicting what the output should be when it's given an input it's not seen before. So, um, so those, those black dots and gray dots, those are perceptrons. This is a very simple multi-layer network. Those are the inputs, the outputs, and those are the weights and the connections. Um, and that's really all that's there to it. So why is all this at the forefront now, and why is all this making such big news? Um, part of it is because um, we've had progress in you know, 20 years ago with backpropagation. Uh, well, I think it's far more than 20 at this point. But uh, backpropagation, and we found an algorithm to get the network to learn. And not only that, we now have the compute power to go after these huge problems. And another reason is that there's an explosion of data, right? There's so much data. And a lot of it is unstructured, right? There's, um, you know, whether it's pixels in a photograph or text in some um, chat that you have, 
or your emails, all this is like highly unstructured data that's just, and it just keeps exploding, right? And that's something that neural nets are really, really good at. They're good at finding patterns and good at dealing with this kind of voluminous um, unstructured data. And, and so, so that is why at this point in time, there's just so much um, research and so much uh, momentum behind these techniques. So I'm going to pause at this point and ask if there are any questions. <laughs> okay, not at this point. Great. So now, uh, okay, this is this is the company I work for. It's called SkyMind. Um, we're a small team, um, ten of us now. We were eight less than a month ago, so <laughs> growing rapidly. <laughs> And what we do is we provide, okay, so the way I would like to explain it is we are the cloud, we want to be or we are the cloud era for deep learning. So we are based on the JVM um, and I don't need to convince this particular group of people to invest in the JVM. Um, so we want to be the go-to for enterprise when they want to implement a deep learning algorithm on their data and, um, and that has access to their ETL pipelines. So um, it's all open source. Everything, all our code is open source. And um, we also have, uh, because it's the JVM, we also have support for Scala. We have some Scala wrappers around some of our libraries. We would very much ap appreciate contributions from you guys. I can go, go through some of those things at the very end. But first, let's just talk about what the challenges possibly could be if you wanted to do scientific computing uh, on the JVM. Um, it's not an easy task, right? And, and why is that? Um, you can't, you can only have, so the, the main thing I'm getting at is, you know, C++ and Fortran have been able to take advantage of SIMD instructions, SIMD is single instruction, multiple data, uh, with compiler support, but Java can't, right? So that's one problem. So you're not really exploiting the, the CPU as much as you can. The second problem is that even on a 64-bit JVM, your array indexing only goes up to 32 bits. So you're severely restricted in terms of memory, right? So this recent effort by our team um, to write a all C++ backend that is plug and play for the framework uh, solves this issue. And um, because we have OpenMP and CUDA directives in there, we can exploit the actual hardware on a chip basis. So we can support GPUs and CPUs and things will run super, super fast. And of course, like this also means that we've extended our array indexing from 32 bits to 64 bits, right? So, um, so, th so that is essentially what, um, what our stack looks like. We have a C++ underbelly and then we have a linear algebra library called ND4J or ND4S that sits on top of it. And then we have DL4J, which is our deep learning library. And the idea is to have everything be plug and play, kind of like the idea being you can you know, swap something out and it should not interfere with anything else. And I think you guys are all very familiar with the concept. So, so now to talk a little bit about uh, machine learning, I didn't really touch upon, touch upon how you go about training a network. Um, there's this algorithm called back propagation. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, raised your hands when I said neural nets, so you guys are familiar. It boils down to the chain rule. Um, and this is a version, and you use something like uh, gradient descent to, um, or many, there are many optimization algorithms that you can use. Um, so this essentially shows how you would scale your learning from one machine to a cluster. And the idea is a lot like this, which is, you know, it might look like MapReduce, but the idea is that you, uh, it's a lot like data parallelism. You take your data, which might be massive, and you, ch you split it up into different chunks, and you send it out to all the, all the machines on your cluster. And then, um, so each, mo each machine has its own copy of the model that you're trying to build. When I say model, what I mean is there are hyperparameters and parameters and all this stuff, but each model has a copy of this. And then 
each model on each machine learns whatever the weight update should be on the network for that particular batch or, or chunk of data. And then it sends the updates back to the master and then they're basically averaged and then sent back out again to the machines to learn on a new data set. And this is done iteratively and therefore you're utilizing all, uh, you're utilizing all the CPU power that you have at your disposal to train. So that's essentially uh, what DL4J is capable of doing, which is that, you know, with our C++ native compute layer, uh, we're really able to take advantage of your hardware and uh, we're able to scale out pretty easily with this model. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about NLP. I think um, we're okay on time, so that's great. So NLP stands for Natural Language Processing and NLP is hard, really hard. <laughs> And the reason is, obviously, because text in language has a lot of uh, nuances and a lot of subtlety, and getting a machine to learn um, all of this vast and complicated subtlety and nuance is no small feat, right? So um, what you will see is that in, uh, in the research, a lot of um, the accuracy for something like sentiment analysis has kind of, has kind of been at a pace of like 1% increase every year, and suddenly there was this this huge explosive increase of 5%, and that was thanks to some research that came out of Stanford, and it was based on this particular architecture of neural nets that I'm, I'm gonna talk about, which is known as recursive neural nets. So it's just another example of how, um, how uh, neural nets have come to the forefront at this time, thanks to the amount of data that's available, and that'll be very clear when I go through some more slides. And so, um, so I showed you guys an example of a feed forward network, right? So that was just very simple input, a hidden layer and output, and, and a bunch of connections and denoting the weights, right? So w one of the restrictions for that kind of uh, model, um, what would one of the restrictions be? The idea is that you can feed it one example and then another example and then another example in no particular order and it should give you the same results, right? It has like no sense of order. It has no sense of, um, of time or steps or in a sequence of steps or anything like that, right? So if you wanted to train anything on a neural net that involved something like a time series or anything that essentially had a sense of order to it, like a sentence inherently has a sense of order. Like the word, uh, the words that are surrounding a, sen a given word has relevance. They're not all the same, right? So you can't, if you can't deal with those kind of uh, complexities and, and uh, nuances with, with a s simple, straightforward MLP. But you can with something known as a recurrent neural net. And uh, the idea of a recurrent neural net in one word would be feedback. It's a fee it, there's a feedback loop. And that is what is um, indicated by the, the, the arrow um, that feeds back from the output layer to the hidden layer. And um, so when you think in terms of a feedback loop, I hope you guys think in terms of memory, right? If you can feed back, um, if you feed back a lot of things, uh, for example, I'm thinking specifically of like uh, if, of um, an SRAM cell because I was a hardware engineer. Never mind that. <laughs> you have you know cross, you have inverters back to back which preserve the state of the cell whether it's a one or a zero. So whenever you have a feedback loop, you have memory, right? So that is that is that is what makes the recurrent neural net so special and so powerful is that it has this ability to remember things and. Um, that means that you can apply it to a different problem set that you couldn't before, or that neural nets weren't applicable for before, right? So again, like a lot of things in neural nets, this is not an idea that just came out. It's in fact an idea that's been around for a while, right? Um, so, so, so then what was the issue? Well, part of the issue was, um, was that um, if you looked into the guts of backpropagation, you'll see, which is the chain rule, which again boils down to multiplying things by multiplying things and multiplying things and multiplying things, right? So the weight matrix gets multiplied by the gradient. And the if the weights are either really small and you have to 
um, and you have many time steps, like this is just one feedback. But imagine if you had to do something over many time steps, and then you get multiplied over and over and over again. And essentially, what you what you end up with is a problem where your gradient either explodes because you've multiplied a large number several times over and it's exposed, or you've multiplied a small number several times over and now it's just like nothing. So it's called the exploding or vanishing gradient problem. So, so that, was, that was the problem with this very simple configuration and that was one of the reasons why recurrent neural nets couldn't be applied to these problems even though it was around in theory. So, um, so then some other research came out fairly recently with a solution for it, and uh, and with a, and it was a tweak to the original idea, and and the tweak was to explicitly add some memory with some control around it, and to make all of this learnable. So there is an input gate, an output gate, and a forget gate, and the parameters that control the in, the forget, the input gate, and the output gate all can be learned, so that now the the cell is able to remember things that are further, further, uh, farther, farther back in memory that it couldn't earlier because of the, the exploding or vanishing gradient problem. So with this in place, a lot of very cool applications have been, um, have been developed with um, these kind of networks uh, with recurrent neural nets. Um, have any of you guys seen these before? I just would like to know, have, you, have you, any of you guys seen any of the examples? Okay, one person, okay, great. So I'm hoping to uh, wow you guys, not my research, but anyway. Uh, so, th you know, the point is that with, you're essentially going from one sequence to another sequence, and you're really only limited by your imagination, because you could think about many, many things in terms of sequences, right? And maybe an obvious example, which is a very hard example, is machine translation, right? To go from like English to French, right? So that would be the many-to-many -many example up here. You go from English to French. Um, you could have a many-to-one example, which is the one that we're going to show you guys, which is this where you take, where the example that we're, that we're gonna show you is where you take a set of movie reviews from IMBD, and they're classified as either positive sentiment or negative sentiment. And um, so that's a many to one. You feed in a review and you get out something that says, this is either positive or this is negative. And then one to many actually is a very interesting use case. Uh, I don't know if you guys have, might not have seen this, but there was some research out of Google and uh, I'm describing the image. It showed uh, a stove with some pizza on top of the stove and you fed it to this network, this image. So the image is the single input and the output was a caption and the caption was three slices, something along the lines of three slices of pizza sitting on top of a white stove. That's pretty incredible considering it's a machine. Um, RNNs are particularly good at this. RNNs are very good at taking in an image and and giving it a caption, and it almost seems magical how that can happen. Um, so the one-to-one -one really is just me showing how you can't really, uh, which, is, which is the regular MLP network, you know, it's just you have, it's pretty static, you just have one input and then a bunch of layers or whatever, and then you have an output, right? So I'm just contrasting that with all these other cases. So kind of glazed over a lot of stuff. Um, we're talking about words, right? How are we going to feed our words into our network? How, how many of you guys have seen Word to Vec before? Great. <laughs> it's a neat party trick and kind of gets old when you've heard it like the, for the thousandth time, but it's still worth putting up there, which is, um, there is this concept called Word to Vec, which is a very shallow neural net that um, was trained on a massive um, corpus which is um, one, the case that we're using here is the Google News Corpus, which has, I believe, um, uh, 13 million unique words and uh, it has 100 billion words in, um, in the corpus. So that is what this net was trained on. And the idea was, um, so it had two, the paper describes two separate approaches. I'm just going to describe the one that was, uh, that the paper recommends. Uh, which is you are approaching um, a word, given when you have a word, 
and in a sentence, there, there are the words on the left and the words on the right. What you're trying to predict is the probability of seeing the neighboring words to the left and the right given the center word. And you, and you, and you train a network on maximizing these probabilities, like the maximum likelihood estimation, and you come up with a representation for each word. And each word, you can also think about this as each word gets converted based on its neighbors to a 300 dimensional space represented by a vector that has 300 separate axes or you know, however you want, well, 300 long column vector, or however you would like to represent it. So that is the idea. It's, it was transformed from this large dimension, um, you know, 13 million words down to 300 long vectors. And that is pretty incredible, right? Um, and what we found, or like what they found, was that um, these, these embeddings or these vectors are very useful at representing meaning, which is why you end up with something that looks like this, which is that king minus man plus woman gives you the vector for queen. And then, as you can see, the, the, the vectors from woman to aunt is approximately in the same direction as man to uncle. So it, it embeds, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, information that gets embedded in this vector space, and it's, it's really incredible. Um, and I can take questions about it later. Um, so this is uh, another, um, another you know, quick snippet of how the embeddings capture the relationship between countries and cities and how you know, most of these are parallel. So that is, oops, sorry. So that is what you use to feed into your network. You, when you are training your recurrent neural net on a sentence, you, the sequence is your sentences and the time steps, or each time step is a word, and each word is represented by one of these vectors. And um, yeah, and another fun application that I was talking about that I think is like really incredible. This is from Andrei Karpati's website. His website is really great. He has a lot of um, very clear, clean explanations. I'd recommend you guys to check it out if you're interested. Is this is this is auto-generated Shakespeare. It's crazy. The, an RNN was given um, the entire corpus for Shakespeare and trained on it, on sequence prediction. So you give, it, you give it a sentence, and then you shift the sentence over, and then that would be the output. So, and then you train it on everything you have, and you feed it like a, you seed it with something initially, and then it just auto generates the rest of the time steps. And this is this is you know Shakespeare that was um, generated by uh, his example that he trained on the entire corpus. Um, so so now we're back to my um, example, which is you know it's a very uh, it's almost like a canonical example, the IMBD data set. Um, classifying the sentiment for this, and this is just a repeat of what um, I was describing to you guys earlier, which is your review is your sentences. They're strung together with as vectors. Each word is a word vector, and then your sentiment is um, a positive or a negative review. So now Andy will talk a little bit about. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. It was pretty clear, right? Um, yeah, I thought, actually. Um, right, so a little bit of word about us before, before I get started. Um, so I don't know how many of you know the Spar Notebook? Who knows about the Spar Notebook? Not that much. Great, that's, that's cool for me because then I can expose myself a little bit more. Um, so the Spar Notebook is, is the only notebook that you can find around which is fully Scala and allows you to, to do some in, interactive sessions with Mainly Spark, of course, as the name uh, is, is stated, but also you can play with Cassandra, Kafka. Uh, there are many, many examples in the, in the, code, in the source code um, <clears throat> organized in notebooks, of course, that allows you to, to do whatever you want. Also machine learning uh, examples, including genomics. If you like genomics, for instance, we have a few examples doing so. Um, and the idea of the notebook is that it allows data scientists to be pretty uh, close to 
uh, the runtime because they can use Park and whatever tool like Kafka, but also um, <clears throat> they can be very effective, right? So they can run code, test, rewrite, retest, and so on without having to rerun a full example for a full um, uh, project with tests, right? Which takes a lot of time because, you know, when you train a model, it takes maybe 20, maybe an hour, 20 minutes, maybe an hour, and then you don't want to retrain all the time, so you want to explore a little bit before returning the algorithm or the model. So it, it allows them to be very efficient, and it's structured as a web page simply with boxes where you type code, you click enter, and what's going on behind is that it sends code over the WebSocket, the code is executed into a new JVM which is spawned for each notebook, and which is actually mainly containing a REPL, and the REPL executes the code and returns the, the, um, the, um, the results. The idea is that there is also a, uh, I mean, uh, since it's a Scala, it's pretty reactive, that means that you can uh, very easily drop some Scala domain uh, classes, instances, and then it will automatically plot over it. So without asking for anything, or you can also ask for a few charts if you like specifically, but it will plot for you uh, whatever data that you have asked for as a table, a part chart, line chart, or whatever. And you can add to these plots dynamically thanks to WebSockets connections. It's based on play, by the way. Um, and interface was based on, on Jupyter's one, uh, but I will refactor it quite a bit in order to, for it to look like a little bit more like RStudio. I'm a old user of R, I kind of like RStudio, and I wanted it to be uh, looking like it. Um, so Della Felas is a company that I've created with my buddy uh, Xavier Todouard, he's in Belgium still, but we are currently creating a, another startup here in, in, in the US. Uh, we've been recently accepted into the uh, Alchemist Accelerator, which is the Y Combinator for B2B slash enterprise, if you like. And what we do essentially is that we, we enable data-driven businesses, so we do a lot of work in insurance, in media, and in genomics, and we allow the data scientists to be very efficient. Not only because they have the notebook, but from the notebook they can generate a lot of things, including jobs and Avro web services or whatever. Um, and why I'm here is because also we do a lot of NLP. On what? On the notebooks. So the notebooks for us is an input, and we do a lot of work around the, note, the, the notebook in order to detect inputs, outputs, the content of the notebook. We link inputs and outputs together. We are constructing context around the inputs and, uh, and the, the processes. That means that we can uh, predict what's, what a data scientist want to do. And we can also do some recommendation like, hey, you may want to use this data set that has this structure because we know the structure because we use Avro and Parker all the time. And, and maybe you can consume the web service in order to check um, if you have the right feeling with this data. And then you can connect directly with Cassandra because we provide the right snippet to do it. Thanks to machine learning, including deep learning, you can do that. And because, of course, the data scientists know what it does when it deployed to production. Right, so if it deploys to production, that means for us that it has a pretty good accuracy, uh, and it has a, right, a high confidence um, on, the, uh, on the job that it just deployed in production. So it consumes data, it consumes CPUs and so on, so I hope it's pretty confident. So the idea of, of the notebook is essentially, as I said, a web page that we can see so much, actually. Um, it had a better resolution before, actually. Um, Maybe I can check display. Should be a little bit, oh, okay. Ah, better. Right, so um, a notebook is this kind of page. Uh, the thing is that this notebook will be published uh, open source uh, collaboratively with SkyMind, and we will uh, provide the, the GitHub repo uh, soon. So you can contact us or we will publish it anyway on our Twitter uh, feeds. And uh, what we do here, so we use a, a cluster that has been uh, created by Canonical because we have a project with Canonical, IBM, uh, NVIDIA, and SkyMine, and SkyMine, yes, in order to do um, deep learning of uh, services. Uh, failures in services. So this is a Mesos cluster, essentially, with a few with a few machines. We have, I think, up to yeah, only 34 CPU right now, but we have also GPUs. 
that we, we can serve, right, to the, to the Spark executors. So, which is pretty neat. We have a few memory, but it's enough for us uh, to, to complete our tasks. Um, and then we can do a lot of things, including, uh, as I said, service detection. So, uh, the idea here, um, as Susan said, is that we can take the World 2 VEC, so it's a pre-trained World 2 VEC model uh, by Google on the Google News um, data, and we will try to predict uh, so the, 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 the code will try to predict um, uh, reviews, uh, uh, IMDB reviews, actually, if it's a good review for the movie or a bad review for the movie. So I will go through the notebook. Uh, as I said, I can't really execute it for a certain number of reasons. But the thing is that we are publishing it. And uh, I will show you one of the main reason why I cannot execute it right now. Because this is how you, de you declare dependencies in the notebook. So you declare it beforehand, and then it's get, it gets included into, uh, into uh, both the driver and the executors. And so it looks like SBT, OK? So we have included a bunch of dependencies, and they all end by this snapshot. So the code is stabilizing right now, and we sh you, you should release this in a few weeks, right? So uh, it's going to be pretty clean and, and uh, pretty good. So um, the interesting thing as well is that we use uh, native implementation. So that means that behind the scene, we can connect to Java CC, through Java CCP uh, and so forth to, um, to LIP and, and D4J as well. To, uh, to the hardware um, efficiently. So this is very, uh, very impressive. Um, well, so the notebook that you will be able to access soon is starting with a classical Java uh, Scala code, a bunch of imports. But you can see that uh, besides the Apache commands, we are importing a lot of things. Uh, to deal with data sets, but also uh, from the neural, neural, neural network uh, packages. Uh, the optimizer in order to be able to uh, collect information while the training is going on. And as I said, so we also have the NGD, ND4J uh, binders in order to be able to use ND arrays. ND arrays are essentially the portage of ND array from NyPy, NumPy on Java. And this is a great work that Susan is also doing quite a lot uh, these days, right? Um, and just for, so you know, there is, I don't know if he's here, but there is uh, a portage, uh, a, a layer on top on D4J, uh, which is called MD4S. And this is essentially a Scala API that allows you to directly uh, use the, the CPU power uh, uh, behind the hood. <clears throat> So um, why we have defined all these resources, these, uh, these uh, packages, so we can start by collecting uh, the Google News um, World 2 VAC. And this is uh, available on S3, so you can access to it pretty easily. So it's a 1.5 gig file that you have to unzip it. Uh, at some point, so uh, I created a small file here uh, that I will collect where I will collect the uh, the file locally, so I won't be able, I won't have to do it all the time. It's, this is something that you have to do as a data scientist. You don't want to always go to the to the web to collect your file, but you will um, locate it locally. You could, you will paste it locally, but also it is a good thing about the notebook is that at least the original file is in the notebook, right? It's not like yeah, you can use my. My, my notebook or whatever, and then he uses a local path that you don't know from where it came, right? So you, you're stuck because you don't have the data, you don't know how to collect it. At least here, because it's in the code, you can do it pretty easily. Um, so when you have unzip it, uh, using the DL4J API, you can load it, right? So, um, and this is pretty easy. So this is how you can load, can load the word 2 vec vector uh, World 2 vector uh, in memory, so that means that he's going to read the uh, the four gigs and ex expand it. It's four gigs file, and uh, put it in memory. So we have uh, four gigs of information that we can access. So this is essentially a lookup table, a word and then a vector, right? Um, it has been trained already. So if you use Spark, the, 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 the Spark API, you can train your own model, by the way. So you can check in MLlib that you can train your own model. You can feed an RDD of, of strings, and then it's going to uh, learn how to structure uh, the data in a 300 uh, space. By the way, if you, look, if you think about this space, you can also 
you saw that these lines were pretty parallel, right? That means that essentially they are part of the, th the same theme. So that means that you know, if you um, look at the dimensions, if you remove some dimensions and so on, so you can look at the data as clustered as, as themes. So in the way you will look at it, you will switch from one theme to the other. This is essentially how you can think about uh, these 300 uh, dimensions, if you like. So the idea that we can learn uh, easily a model, a deep learning model. So what I'm going to do is that we will train a two layers uh, model. Uh, the first one is going to be the LSTM one with 200 uh, uh, um, input, um, sorry, uh, cells. And the last one, which is the output, is going to be a two, uh, two cells one, of course, because we will say if it's a positive or negative one. So we have only two outputs as a classification. So the size of the batches that we're going to use for, for the training um, is 50. So we pass the vector size, which is uh, 200, because it's the number of dimensions that we use, a number of epoch for the SGD. Uh, then uh, this is something from, uh, from notebook that allows you to plot, um, to plot uh, collections, essentially. And the idea is that I go from my, minus 6 to 6 uh, by quarter. And then I plot the soft science of max. And in order to do that, I just call line chart and then sizes. And I give a size to the plot. And the idea is that row plus plus is, a, you know, is, a, is able to, call, to concatenate two, uh, two widgets. And they will be put one behind uh, the other, uh, below the other. And row can actually stack them in a row. There is also column layout and so on and so forth. But anyway, so this is actually uh, how a soft uh, sign is looking uh, like, and the soft max is looking like. So you can see um, more or less how it's structured, and the soft max is uh, is looking like something you know that can uh, separate pretty uh, confidently uh, two class two classes. Right. So this is how you can create the LSTM layer now. So the idea is that you can just use the builder. So to be honest, actually, the, the, the title is in Scala, but this is a good thing with Scala is that we can use a Java API. So this thing hasn't been ported with a Java um, you know, convention, but actually it's pretty neat as well because at least it uses the builder uh, API. So uh, pattern, sorry. So the idea is that we put, uh, we pass, uh, the vector size, with the, which is 300, of course, because we're going to input uh, points in the world to like space. The output is uh, 200. So we want 200 steps, right? So it's more or less if uh, sentence, sentences, if you think like that, or paragraphs of 200 words that we can uh, try to uh, train on. And then uh, the activation, as I, as I shown before, is a soft sign. Um, then we will um, apply a simple logistic regression onto, onto these uh, input, hidden inputs, uh, input cell, sorry. And then in order to do that, we, we can construct this output layer that will be pluggable into the RNN network. And to do so, we use the activation softmax uh, with the, wait, yeah, the last function is this MSX end. MSX end. And um, of course, since we had 200 input uh, hidden cells, then we have 200 inputs now, and it comes out as a two output uh, result. So the good thing is that we, you, you will be able to uh, go through these notebooks uh, at home and being able to replay it at will, right? So, uh, so I'm not going to do it because it might take a lot of time uh, to do so, and I don't have a, anyway. So, um, now we can create this model, right? So in order to do so, we have to pass how we, we will uh, optimize uh, which gradient we're going to use. We're going to use the stochastic gradient with one iteration for each batch. Uh, the updater um, is uh, DMS prop. That means that we use um, the mean square of the differences on the gradient, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we initialize with the Xavier method, so it's pretty important to to note, uh, it's also about vanishing. Uh, we use regularization. We uh, normalize uh, the gradient so they don't they don't get too large or too too uh, too small. So we can cap it to one. So this is uh, the cap. Uh, learning rate is a magic number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hyperparameters, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we know that this one works pretty well, right? Um, how we know it, so this is a secret sauce. Uh, 
Um, it takes a few minutes to know. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. Then uh, we are adding uh, the two layers that we want to uh, add into our uh, recurrent network, and then we use some. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it does, but I mean, just I think it's speeding up the thing uh, initially, and then we of course ask for propagation to optimize it uh, efficiently, and finally we initialize what is called the multi-layer network with this configuration. Now we need to Sparkify it, right? To Sparkify it, this, this model, we just have to import this uh, class. We can say, okay, I want to average each iteration, right? So every time I get the, 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 the result from the executors, so I want to average, and then I want to uh, propagate uh, to the executors once again, and then return over there. And then we can uh, encapsulate uh, the network that we just created with the Spark context, and then we got this uh, Spark therefore j uh, multi-layer thingy. How about the data? Um, so there is uh, two things that we need to do, is that um, we have to take the data uh, on the web, we have to unpack it to, uh, to look at the structure, and also we have to put it some, somehow in Spark, right, in order to be able to train the, the model on Spark. So the idea is that we, we should be able to train uh, using the data that are distributed and not locally available. So what we're gonna do is that we take this um, information that has been created uh, by Stanford that we'll see later, and it has this structure. So we have 200 and 500 reviews, in the positive reviews in the train set, and the same amount of negative uh, uh, reviews in the train set as well, and we have the same amount in the, in the test set. So. Um, the data set that we are going to create are uh, three-dimensional, so uh, we have 10 reviews per data set. We have uh, 300, of course, dimensions, and 100 is the number of words that we, we will use per review, right? Uh, it's not 100 random words, so it's the 100 first words, but the ones that are, of course, in the word 2 vec uh, space, otherwise they would be completely useless. Um, so how, I, I have hidden here a very large block of code which is taking the data and, uh, and uh, creating data sets. Um, so I'm not going to go through it. The most important part is how the heck can I take a token, I convert it into the word 2 vec space, and then finally create a, uh, a vector that I can use in order to supervise uh, my training. So in order to do that, so you, we use the word 2 vec uh, object and then we, we get the vector uh, out of this token, um, out of the way to vect um, space by using this method onto the token, right? So we get a vector, which is an, uh, an array, essentially. And what we do is that we say, okay, so I want uh, to create a, th a three-dimension point where the, which is located in at the review index, so the current review in the zero to nine, and then we put all the information, which is uh, the, uh, the 300 information, and then we uh, expose it at the token index. So actually, this is uh, the, the index of the word. Right, so now about the data. So it's a data which is available on the Stanford website. Uh, this is actually a, a project that has been run in there, and they took all the NB, MDB uh, reviews and they started classifying it. So in order to do it, so I, I get the data and enter it and then I put it locally and then I can create this iterator over the data that, that will uh, take a review, convert it into the word 2 vec space, create a data set around it and then uh, pass it to me. So this is the ugly part. This is the thing that we have to uh, change before um, we, we open source it. Uh, right now, so everything is in memory, so and in order to put it into, uh, into the executors, we load, it, we load everything into the main memory right now, and then we parallelize it. So this is very ugly, uh, but it's just, just a matter of a few lines of code in order to put the files uh, remotely, but in order to do that, so we need to do something which is not so easy then now, is to put the work to vec mobile onto each executor of the Spark uh, cluster. That means that we need to broadcast it. 
And since it's a four gigs thing, so it may take a little bit of time to do it, so we need to see how we can uh, speed up uh, these this operations. But uh, yeah, we, we're getting close to that. Anyway, so we collect information, we parallelize it. Uh, in order to train it, so we just have to ask, okay, fit data set, and we provide the RDD, and, and it will use you know, this uh, process super step uh, operations in order to train uh, local neural network, um, uh, propagate uh, and aggregate the, uh, the weight onto the driver, and then it will uh, uh, iterate for, for the new step. Doing the prediction is easy as well. So we also create an RDD. Um, and then, so we have access to the data uh, on the cluster. And uh, for each data set into the cluster, so we can uh, take out the features and we uh, can ask the train network to predict onto the features. And we have the predictions which will be negative, positive, negative, positive, and we can check the accuracy. Uh, in the next version, the, ne the version that we will also uh, deliver, we will also have some plots that are, will be showing the accuracy, the prediction, the propagation. So we, there are a lot of things that we can uh, listening to while training the, the algorithm. So that means that we can early stop, you know, uh, the training if we see that is going, you know. In the wild, we can ask uh, the notebook to okay stop the model. I'm going to change a little bit my parameter because I'm losing my time right now. So, yeah, this is reaching the end. So it's not too long a notebook, I would say, because there is a lot of, uh, of explanation and uh, uh, on purpose. And uh, yeah, I mean, it can, it can do very tricky things, um, like understanding um, uh, what is review. And as Susan said, NLP is art. And actually, even the sentence NLP is hard is hard to interpret, right? So. Um, that's pretty much it um, for now, right? Yeah? Do you have any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. So yeah. the, the obvious is question is, uh, what about TensorFlow now that it's parallelizable? Yeah, but um, we're, in, we're on the JVM, right? <laughs> that really matters for a lot of people who are in enterprise. When they think in terms of you know connecting, um, to their ETL or whatever, they'd rather work with something that's on the JVM. So yeah, the thing is that it's very cool to have the model which is trained, right? But then, uh, then you have to interact with many other things, right? Because now you have your re reviews, okay? So are you going to ask your business to go to whatever Scala code to collect it and to make its review using uh, the predict function? No, right? So you want to do something which is pretty uh, classic is creating a web service onto it and then you know serving this information, right? And that means that if you start doing it in Python, that there is high chance that you won't be scalable, right? If you can start doing it with Python, then you will have to introduce a new layer into your infrastructure. And and if you think about enterprise, which is my concern, then there is 99% of the people that will just say, no, I won't deploy any Python in my infrastructure. I can't go to any department and say, yeah, I have some small Python script. It's pretty cool. Can you deploy it? They will just go, they will, yeah, they will just say no, and then you can go away and then rewrite everything. And if you leave your data scientists write everything in Python, and then you have to rewrite everything, right? So yeah. tens of, that's in flow for me is a toy. Yeah, and also the fact that we have a native compute layer that optimizes on um, on the basis of the chip that you're running on is no small feat, you know. And so um, I mentioned ND4J. So just to be clear, it's a linear algebra library. We have support for ND arrays. A lot of languages have gotten this right, but um, not really in the Java world or really in you know, like for example, Breeze. I think only supports. Uh, 4D, I think, or 5D, I'm not sure. And I don't know about CUDA support for Breeze either. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's no small feat to get the stack to work with a C++ underbelly. And a lot of that is with Java CPP, which is a really great, um, a great API that was written, that's written by one of our engineers uh, that basically hooks into the JNI based on the syntax and, um, and semantics of, of the language similarities, so. I encourage you guys to look it up if you're interested. Yeah. Any that, other questions? I think, well. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Thanks for being a great audience. Thank you.